Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books and Sports, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Paul Nepper, and today we'll be talking to Kevin Bryant about his new book, Spies on the Sidelines, The High-Stakes World of NFL Espionage. Kevin has over 20 years of experience safeguarding and gathering information for the Department of Defense. Kevin, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much, Paul. Appreciate you having me on. Thanks for coming on. Um, I can't wait to dig into this stuff. It's it's juicy, juicy topics, spying. Um, first, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, kind of your work history, your history in, in, you know, in dealing with information? Sure. Yeah. So like you mentioned, uh, I think I've got 24 years of experience now, um, both on the offensive and defensive side of, you know, collecting and protecting information uh, for the Army. Um, I spent 13 years of that as a special agent. I'm a French and Arabic linguist. um, So dabble in all whole bunch of different stuff. And um, yeah, so I've got a a master's degrees in intelligence studies and sports management. And my bachelor's is in history. So I kind of combined all of that, you know, the job experience as well as all the degrees into you know, one big thing. And when I got, you know, interested in, um, you know, writing on this topic, I thought, you know, well, heck, uh, you know, with all the the experience and the degrees, I was like, it's kind of fits exactly, you know, um, exactly my, my wheelhouse and my expertise. So, um, I thought, you know, this is this, I think this would be a good book topic for me. And, uh, off I went and, you know, seven years later, here I am talking to you. Here we are. Um, I, I want to. I can't wait to dive into all the different, you know, types of information gathering and spying techniques that were used. But before that, I'm, I'm curious about your kind of the research process. How did you go about finding uh, or learning about all these different kinds of of spying activities? I mean, you have examples in there from the early years of the NFL. How did you How did you find all this information? Right. Yeah. So that was the biggest challenge. So. Um, you know, I started just on the internet. Um, I, I, I you know, I, after Spygate and then after, um, you know, Josh McDaniels, who was the former Patriots offensive coordinator, moved over to Denver, brought a videographer along with him. And that videographer got caught, uh, recording a San Francisco 49ers walkthrough practice. At that point, I just, you know, with my background, I got really curious and just wondered, you know, how much of the spying stuff goes on in sports? You know, we know, we all know about it in the international world of, you know, espionage and okay, yeah, yeah, countries spy on each other. And, you know, and, and, and if, you know, I think furthermore, a lot of people are aware of corporate espionage. You know, if, if someone wants to get, you know, trade secrets on their rivals, uh, especially, you know, that's big, like with the pharmaceutical companies, you know, looking for who can come up with a cure to cancer, right? Because if you can do that, how many billions and billions of dollars is that worth, right? So, you know, there's all this economic competition that goes on in the spying arena. Uh, but I think, you know, when it comes to spying in sports, that's kind of like, you know, you know, everybody's, okay, yeah, maybe once in a blue moon, like, you know, we've heard about Spygate. Okay, yeah, that goes on. But, you know, that's, that's an, you know, an abnormality. Um and what I realized when I started doing the internet research was this isn't an abnormality at all. This has gone on through the entire history of the NFL. Um, the thing is, the stories are stuck in old, you know, newspaper articles or, you know, um, you know, old books. Um, and so I, it was really a challenge to put find all the material for the book and to get enough material to produce a book. So I ended up reading about 50 books total that were written by or about coaches to, you know, picking out sometimes as little as a paragraph here or there, sometimes reading an entire book with nothing in there at all for me. And then sometimes I'd find like five whole pages I could use. And I was like, oh, here's a treasure trove, you know, so it was a labor of love. Um, and then, you know, also doing some interviews. But the challenging part with the interviews was, you know, no one wants to open up about this subject because one, as soon as you join a team, you sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, no one wants to taint the legacies of, you know, coaches or players that are in the game. And no one wants to get anybody in trouble, you know, especially when, you know, obviously members of the NFL are making their livelihood this way. And so 
the interviews that I did get were all conducted anonymous, anonymously so that, um, you know, they felt comfortable sharing what they did know with me. Yeah. So I, I will start off with a quote unquote kind of legal intelligence gathering in the NFL. Um, and I don't know if, I don't know if the average fan knows that the lengths that teams go to, to gather information about opponents. I mean, I consider myself a pretty big football fan and I didn't know, uh, a lot of this stuff. Um, of course the intelligence gathering really starts with scouting, I would say. And, um, one technique I didn't know about was the use of film services like pro football focus to scout teams. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, when it comes to advanced scouting, um, obviously, so teams are still sending scouts to, you know, upcoming opponents games to watch them and to see what's going on as well as studying film. I think the question is, you know, why do you still even need to send scouts to watch opponents play with the film that's available today? But there's lots of stuff that you, um, there's a few things you can't get, um, from film that is handy. Uh, one is watching the speed of the game. Uh, film does not reflect that. So if you want to see how fast players actually are on the field, you really need to watch that live. The other thing is signals, you know, signals collection. Um, and that has largely gone away today due to uh, the use of headset communications between coaches and players. But that still goes on. Um, it goes on either when headset, there are headset communication problems or uh, if a quarterback wants to call an audible. So they're going to say uh, quarterback's typically going to verbally call a new play as well as send a signal out to the wide receivers that are far enough away that especially for an away game are not going to be able to hear over all the noise of the crowd. So, um, so yeah, they send scouts and hopefully the scouts can pick up a couple of these signals for the team so that, you know, when, when they're playing and their say, same team sees this, you know, the same signal coming in, it's actually a tip off as though the play that is, is coming up. Um, so yeah. And then when you get into scouting, really, you're looking for, um, you know, the main thing you're building is trying to figure out teams, tendencies and tells, uh, tells are like in poker where, you know, a, a bad poker player, um, well, you know, all poker players, uh, to some extent are going to have a tell to, um, you know, to kind of tip off, say they have a good hand, you know, what's the clue that they have a good hand? It could be, uh, it could be how much they bet. It could be the big smile that they're wearing on their face, right? It could be, they get really serious and nervous all of a sudden. It can be a bunch of different things, but these are all indicators um, of what they have. So teams are looking for that. Uh, they're also building tendencies. And this is where, you know, you mentioned pro scout, uh, pro football focus, um, these types of services, what they allow teams to do is to actually go in and to search um, the database, a database of plays by their opponents. So let's say the Broncos are about to play the Raiders. Okay. The Broncos coaching staff can go into the Raiders that year and say, okay, uh, 2023, I want to see. All Raiders plays on, let's say, third and three or shorter yardage. So third and three, third and two, or third and one. And what that will do is that that software will pull up all of those plays for you. And then the coaches can go through and watch them, decipher what was done, and then build and then build a you know a spreadsheet of tendencies and figure out, okay, well, they they had they were in that situation, uh, let's say, 50 times so far this season and you know uh, 40 of those plays was a run straight up the middle another five plays they ran it out wide and another five plays they you know threw a screen pass or something like that and so statistically they can start analyzing what is the most likely course of action that the Raiders are going to take in that situation and that becomes extremely helpful when you're trying to figure out What's your opponent going to do during the game in every, you know, every set of situations that uh, you can imagine? Uh, another way of 
A very common way of attempting to gather information in the NFL, which you talk about in the book, is by teams will bring in or hire or just bring in on a temporary basis um, either players or coaches who once worked for their opponent. Um, how do, what? How does that work and what type of information are they looking for in, in those instances? Yeah, so obviously anytime a player or a coach is cut, from a team, um, they're free to be signed by whoever, by any anybody. Um, and also, if a a player is a member of a practice squad, and they are signed to another team's regular roster, okay, they can just be picked up. Meaning, so if the Kansas City Chiefs want to sign a Buffalo Bills player who is currently on the Bills practice squad, as long as they're willing to pull them up to, to the regular roster, the Bills can't stop it. The Chiefs can just say, hey, we're signing him. And as long as that player is good with it, off he goes. Okay. And given the discrepancy in pay uh, between being on a practice roster and a full time roster, um, they're going to do it each and every time. So, um, so that's, that's how you get those guys. Now, what I will say is, you know, when you're signing players and coaches from um, that were, you know, recently with another team, um, what really helps is one, if you can get a guy who has recently been with a team, right? Because if, if if the guy was, you know, with a team a couple years ago, yeah, he may be able to tell you something, but it's not as much as a guy, obviously, who was just there last week. Um, so, you know, timeliness becomes a factor. Their position is a big factor too. So signing, let's say, uh, a wide receiver is not going to be of the same value as signing a quarterback, okay? Because a quarterback, he understands the entire offense and everybody's role in that offense, Whereas a, whereas a wide receiver is just going to under, understand the routes that he's running and what, what goes on, along with that. Um, and then the other big thing is just, you know, how good of a memory does a player have? How smart is he? How much is he just able to pick up? And um, all of that can, can um, have a big impact on how useful a player is when he's signed to a team. And obviously, the longer he's there. You know, the more he's going to learn, the more he's going to know about the other players in the system, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that comes into play. Um, but that can be a really big advantage for teams that know how to exploit it. And the teams that can exploit it well are, you know, it's not just, you know, in my book, I talk about all the collection at, um, activities that are, you know, it's kind of broken down by topic. But what I would say is that all of those, they blend together. So if you take the Patriots, for example, you know, during like Spygate years, you know, they're not just collecting signals on other teams, okay, by recording those signals um, with their videographers. What they're doing is when they bring in players from other teams, they're showing that signal and saying, hey, Bob, so we know this signal right here, and they'll show the signal, right, that they have recorded, used to correspond to this play. And then they show that play up on the screen. When you left last week, was that still, did that, that signal equal that play? And the guy will say, yes, it did. Or, oh, no, that got changed two weeks ago. It's now this signal right here, right? So they're using a kind of a, a bunch of different techniques and blending them all together. And just like, like countries do when gathering information on each other, right? We're not, you don't just use one int meaning one form of intelligence, you use multiple means of intelligence collection to gather the information and to verify it. And so, and that's what teams are still doing today. Yeah. Right. And, and what are the, what are some of the type of countermeasures that coaches take to try and avoid that, you know, avoid revealing information to other teams? Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's a long, long laundry list of techniques that teams use for that, obviously, and it depends on the collection technique. So since we were just talking about, um, you know, signing players from different, you know, from a different team, I'll give you an example there. So, you know, if you're the, if you're the bills, okay. And the chiefs just signed a player off your practice roster. Okay. And you know why they did it. Okay. You know, they're going to debrief this guy for the upcoming game. Um, what you may have is, okay, so they grabbed one of your wide receivers. And you go, you know what? Okay. So since he's going to know our plays, and we've only got a few options, okay? We've, we've only got a week. And if we try to change all of our plays all at once, it's not going to go well. Because one, there's not enough time. 
Okay, every every minute of a team schedule week to week is pretty much accounted for. Okay, so it's really tough. Even if you did have the time, what are the chances that you know um, all the players on the roster or an entire offense or entire defense are going to be able to learn that play, a bunch of new plays, okay, in time and not make a mistake during the upcoming game? Very, very low. Okay, so instead of changing everything, they're just going to say, you know what, let's just change a thing or two. Okay, and then when you change a thing or two, when you change a play or two, it means it throws a little, oh, like, okay, this play, I know that, oh, wait, the player sees that signal coming in. He's like, wait, I don't know what that signal is. So, huh, things have changed. How much has changed? I don't know now, but I know stuff has changed. That's all I can tell the coach. Stuff has changed, and I don't know what this is. And then the coach goes, oh, well, how much can we really trust? Okay. Furthermore, you can try to sucker a team in. Okay. So meaning you had this play, let's call it 32 x-ray. 32 x-ray used to be, let's say it's a slant, uh, a slant, you know, a toss um, out to, you know, a receiver. Well, if instead of it being a slant, it's now a, okay, yeah, you're going to slant over the middle, but then you're going to break up field and go for a big, you know, a big play down the field. Okay. And so what you try to do is, you know, you call that play and you make it look just like it's a short yard slant play, just like it's always been. Okay. It's a, it's a three or four yard slant over the middle, but you know, and it may be on, let's say it's on third and three play. So it looks just, it's a short passing play to try to get a first down. But suddenly, okay, when the whole defense gets sucked in, because when you call that play at the line of scrimmage, right, which is how you're going to do it, because you want that defender or you want that person who's on the other team to be able to hear it, okay? You want him to know what's about to go. And then he goes to the coach of the opposing team and says, hey, coach, coach, they're about to run this play. They're about to run this play. And so everybody, the defense gets all adjusted. They think they know what's about to happen. But in reality, it's not a, you know, four-yard slant. It's a four-yard slant, it, you know, that's followed by a 40-yard 40 40-yard 40 sprint up the middle of the field where there's no safeties anymore because they're all expecting a short pass play. And so, you know, those are the types of things that teams use to try to – sometimes it's just we try to prevent teams from gathering our information, but other times it's how do you exploit the information that they know about you. And that can be a really, really effective technique, but it takes a lot more time and a lot more um, creativity as well to figure out how to do all of that. Speaking of creativity, I um, <clears throat> I love the stuff on skunking. Um, you know, moving into some things that are maybe not quite as legal or accepted in the league. Um, let, let's start with skunking. What is skunking and is it legal in the NFL? Yeah, so skunking is simply spying on another team's practice. Um, it's a football term, and it's been going around. It's been going on since the beginning of the NFL's history. Uh, before the NFL even began, it was very popular in college football back in the day. Um, and so, yeah, is it is it permissible? Um, Yes, no, maybe so, right? Uh, it depends. How many lawyers do you have in a room and whose opinion are you going to listen to? Um, so here's what I will say. Um, teams have gotten in trouble for this in the NFL in the past, and teams have done it with absolutely no repercussions whatsoever in the NFL's history. So it depends who the NFL commissioner is at the time. There is no set specific rule that says you cannot spy on another team's practices. Um, but, um, you know, if you're doing something like, let's say, breaking into the practice facility, especially if it's a indoor facility to try to do this, could you get in trouble for it? Well, heck yeah. I mean, you could get charged with trespassing then, right? So you could potentially, it could be illegal. But then it becomes a question of, well, isn't the NFL just a corporation? And aren't NFL teams merely branches of a corporation? So if you're committing corporate espionage, if you're committing, you know, industrial, um, you know, espionage, corporate espionage, can it be corporate espionage if it's, 
if you're a part of the same corporation? I don't know, right? All questions for lawyers, right? So it gets really, really complicated. And um, so we were talking about this, you know, when I did my sports management master's degree of, you know, this was one of the topics that came up. Like when you're talking about spying in sports, it's really hard to define and figure out because of all of that. Um, there have been teams that have been that actually in baseball, there was a person who ended up uh, breaking into another team's um, computer accounts and was actually put in prison uh, for a number of years because of that. So, you know, it can be considered a crime. Um, it all depends on the means and the methods and all of that. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's um, so I'll give you an example of, you know, how it can be done. Obviously, you can. um uh, it's gone on this as recently as um well let's say uh you know the patriots rams super bowl um when you know the rams were known as the greatest show on turf um and they were huge favorites um going up against the patriots who were a rather pedestrian team um you know, offensively and their offensive and defensive ranks were pretty mediocre for a team that made it to the Super Bowl. The Rams were the best team offensively, the third best team defensively. They look like sure a sure thing to win it. Um, and so the day before the Super Bowl, they both held a walkthrough practice at the Super Bowl facility. And the Patriots went first and the Rams went second. Uh, when the Patriots were done with their walkthrough practice, the, all their staff left the field, except for a couple videographers. Now, the videographers had all their equipment put away. They were just simply malingering. Um, but they did see what the Patriots were doing. And, I mean, what the Rams uh, were doing during their walkthrough practice. And during it, you know, they used their star running back, Marshall Falk. They showed him in a couple unusual, um, being used in a couple of unusual ways. Uh, one was returning kickoffs that he hadn't done all season. The other was catching passes out of the flat which he typically had not done. They also ran a bunch of short yardage plays, um, you know, inside the red zone that they had never used before in the um, regular season. And after that, those videographers, they went back. One of them went back and was deep in and said, hey, to, to a Patriots coach, I saw all this and you should probably debrief me on everything I just saw. And they did. And they were thus ready for all this. And the Patriot, uh, the Rams were like, how did they know all this? They must have spied on a practice and, you know, they must have recorded a practice. Well, they didn't record it, but they had a spy sitting in the whole thing, you know, and this was nothing new for the Patriots. You know, they had a habit of doing this. They'd done it before. They did it after. Even Bill Belichick's son, who's a member of the coaching staff, has been kicked out of an opponent's practice for doing this exact same thing. Um, so it's something that's taught. It's institutionalized. But, you know, what I will say, this isn't just a Patriots thing. You know, teams have been doing this throughout the history of the entire league. It goes on. Um, you know, teams are so paranoid that they even sometimes will rent out entire levels of hotel rooms that overlook a practice field just to make sure that an opponent can't get a room up there and be able to spy on your team. And it's not that they're, par I mean, well, it is they're paranoid, but they're paranoid for a reason because teams have done all of this type of stuff to try to get that advantage. I, I mean, the best, I think the best story in that regard had to be Peyton Manning uh, forcing the Broncos to hold a walkthrough in a forest. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah, I mean, Peyton Manning was absolutely paranoid about the Patriots. Uh, and I can give a few few other examples of that. But so, yeah, so the Patriots, uh, the Broncos are about to play the Patriots in New England. And, um, they're on their way to everyone thanks the practice facility where they're going to hold their practice and the bus pulls over and no one has any clue what the heck's going on other than Pey uh, Peyton Manning. Right. And so they get out and coaches like, all right, you know, this way, here we go. And they're literally in the middle of nowhere. Okay. And they're just like, yeah, we're just going to, we're just going to walk through these trees here. And, and that's what they do. And, you know, they go hiking. I don't know, you know, uh, probably half a mile or so through these trees, through this forest. And everybody's just shaking their head, you know. And they get to this clearing and they're like, okay, this is where we're holding practice. And, uh, you know, and it comes out later um, that this was this was Peyton Manning's idea. Um, he did not trust 
um, to hold the practice at the location that the Broncos had said, um, you know, plan to hold their walkthrough practice. He said, nope. He said, the Patriots are going to be spying on us if we go there. You don't want to do it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go find some random spot and go practice. And so that's what they did. You know, they found a spot in the middle of the woods and, and, and held a walkthrough practice out there, um, which sounds ridiculous. But, you know, there are teams like, uh, you know, take the play, the Philly special. When the Patriots, Patriots Philly Super Bowl, okay, the 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 Philly special, which was basically a play where you know um, the you know the the Eagles quarterback, um, I can't remember if it was a handoff or a pass behind the line of scrimmage, but either way, he gets rid of the ball, he you know hands it off or throws it, and then you know he snuck out of the backfield, the quarterback did, and gets into the you know the end zone, and they throw past him, and he scores on like a one yard one or two yard pass play. Right. Okay. But the Eagles were so so paranoid that the Patriots would learn about that play that they never practiced it. Not only did they do like Patriot, you know, unlike Peyton Manning and hold the practice in the middle of a forest, they said, we're not practicing it at all. Period. All we're going to do is talk about it because that's how paranoid we are, you know? And so it just goes to show, man, um, you know, um, you know, uh, teams are, you know, they're, they're trying to do their due diligence to ensure that their opponents can't gather information on them. And, um, and I think it goes to show, you know, just how seriously teams take it and, and what a difference they think it can make. And let me tell you, it can make a huge, huge difference. And I'm sure we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this more. So. Yeah. And I, I mean, one of the most entertaining parts of the book was kind of the various examples of, of ways in which, uh, teams attempted to to watch practices uh, from from a, a dwarf <laughs> in a stroller to right. uh, a priest. And I don't, did you have a favorite kind of skunking story? Yeah, um, I mean everybody loves the uh, the little person in a stroller one. Um, you know, I, I think my absolute favorite was probably um, with um, the Chargers and 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 Sid Gilman. Um, so. They're about to play in the um, the AFC. Um, they're about to play in a in a championship game. And what uh, Sid Gilman does is he calls up the other team's head coach and he says, "Hey, um, you know the championships game is going to be held here in San Diego, um, but you don't need to worry about." Um, um, they're actually playing the they're playing the Patriots. Okay. So he calls um, Holovac, Coach Holovac from the Patriots, and says, "Hey, you don't need to worry about getting, you know, finding a practice field for you guys and all that kind of stuff when you come down here. Going to be good. We'll set everything up for you. You'll be playing. You know, you can practice on a military base uh, here in San Diego, and um, I'll have everything set for you. Marines are going to help you out. Anything you need, you just talk to these guys, right? So, and Coach Holovac's like, oh, great, you know, oh, you're such a nice guy. Thanks so much, and blah 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 blah, right?" Well, what he doesn't know is that Sid Gilman has infiltrated a couple members of his staff into the Marine help, okay? And the Marines actually give these, you know, they manage to get Marine um, uniforms and everything. So these Marines that are on the sidelines to act as gophers, hand out water, whatever, whatever the Patriots need, okay? They're standing right there watching the entire... Patriots practice the entire week leading up to the championship game. And as a result of this, Sid Gilman and the Chargers know everything the Patriots are going to do. They've seen all of it. Okay. And the Chargers ended up winning the game. I think it's 61 to seven. Okay. And the only way that the Patriots ever score is when the Patriots quarterback, Babe Prilly, just literally designs a play on the spot. You know, like we used to do as kids, draw a play in the dirt. Well, that's what they really does because he's like, nothing we're doing is working. I'm just going to make something up and hope this thing works. And that catches the Chargers off guard because they haven't seen this thing before, right? But I think that just goes to show, you know, how overwhelming spying tactics can be to opponents because when you know everything that's going on, when you know what the game plan is, when you know all the plays, all the trick plays that are going to be inserted, everything, and they just stifle all of it right from the get go, um, yeah, it can be it it can be it can be the difference between two teams being evenly matched 
to an absolute complete blowout like 61 to 7. And I've got a few examples of my in, in Spies on the Sidelines of exactly this, where, you know, I've got, you know, example in there of one team plays the other in week one of, you know, in, in a, you know, they play twice in the year. And, and the first time they play, the score is, you know, it's a seven point difference. And then the second game, after a bunch of spying takes place, the second, the other team that lost the first game ends up winning by 50 points. And, you know, that's just how big of an impact this stuff can make. Yeah, it, it was fascinating. <clears throat> um, another big way of collecting information that you talk about in the book is through locker room collection. Um, what are some of the ways that teams gather information from an opponent's locker room? Yeah, so one of the main ways is, um, you know, what we what's known as dumpster diving. Um, so, you know, you're, you're going through, you're looking for paperwork. Um, and so whenever a visiting team in particular uh, leaves a locker room, there's going to be personnel within the home team staff that goes through that locker room looking for information of value. Um, and that can extend, I mean, that can extend to where that team is practicing. Okay. So, it, you know, around that practice field, it could extend to the hotel. It could have members of the team's, ho- uh, members of the hotel staff in on it so that when they go through their hotel rooms, when they go through the lobby trash to, Hey, any trash you have from any of these locations, I want you to bring it to us. Or I want you to sift through it to look for any plays or anything that may be of value. And they may train these guys on all of this. Okay. They may be paid to do all of this. Um, even, even team facility trashes and dumpsters. Okay. So who's your trash service? Who comes into your team headquarters? Can they be paid off to do this? How much do you think those guys make? 15, 20 bucks an hour, right? So if you're an NFL team that's willing to say, hey, if you're, if you're willing to bring me all the, tr- all the trash, all the paperwork you get out of this team's, you know, trash, I'll, 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 I'll hand you, you know, I'll hand you $2,000 every time you bring me something valuable. Oh, heck yeah, sure, right? They're going to do it. So all of this stuff, when it comes to paperwork, it, teams have to be very, um, you know, very careful about how they do it. There's a bunch of different techniques they use to try to prevent that, such as binding all of their paperwork together so that when they hand stuff out, uh, members of the security team gather it all back in in a big, you know, a big package. Um, shredding paperwork. Some teams actually bring shredders into locker rooms, and then any of that paperwork that they hand out is shredded before they leave. Um, that's another way. Obviously, a lot of stuff today is... is um, you know, held digitally on computers or tablets. And so you don't have that fear of, um, of paperwork being left around. Of course, then you have a fear of entire, uh, you know, of computers <laughs> and, and playbooks uh, on tablets being left behind as well. But, uh, but there are other ways that they deal with that. So, and then, um, uh, so the other locker room thing that you have to worry about is listening devices. And that is a, uh, a big one. And it's not just listening devices. It's being listened, listened to, listened in, because you don't necessarily need any high-speed equipment to listen in to another team's um, locker rooms. Um, so I give an incident in my book about how a bunch of Philadelphia Eagle cheerleaders were spied upon um, in their locker rooms, right? Um, obviously, people weren't caring about what they were talking about, um, but they were, um, but they were able to spy on these ladies as they're getting changed for years, if not decades. And so, if if cheerleaders can be spied upon in that matter, um, can NFL teams? Well, yes, they can. Obviously, you know, there's vents, um, there are doors. And so, you know, you've had coaches that have literally had equipment members go in and say, hey, while we're in here, I want every nook and cranny covered over. If there's a door jam, you cover it. You tape over it. If there's a vent, you cover it up. If, you know, we play white noise, we're, we're going to play music over the top of it. We're going to, you know, do all of this type of stuff. Um, Peyton Manning, as of last year, who is, you know, obviously, as we mentioned before, paranoid to play um, in New England. 
whenever he was in the visiting locker room um, in Gillette Stadium, he used to, one, try not to talk at all in the, in the locker room. If he absolutely had to talk strategy, he would bring his wide receivers into the shower room. Um, and I'm sure he turned on the water to, you know, to have, um, to mask the sound of his voice, to mask the conversation and, and hold conversations that way. Um, because you know, that's what he felt needed to be done to, to be able to, um, you know, have, have some assurance that the information was going to be just between him and his teammates. So, um, you know, and and I, I don't, you know, I tried and tried to find an, an instance of, um, you know, a, an instance where a listening vice was known to be used in professional football. And I couldn't. I couldn't. What I did find, though, was uh, a coach who said, hey, I was approached by an opponent who came up to me after the game. And this was a big name coach, big name college football program. And he said, um, this coach admitted to me. He said, yes. Uh, we put a listening device in your locker room and it was amazing. You still beat us. Even though we knew uh, so much about what you were going to do. We spied on your practices before the game, you know, leading up to it. We put a listening device in your locker room and you still beat us. Um, and so, you know, if that goes on in college football, um, and he said that coach had since gone on to the pros, um, you know, if it goes on in college, it goes on in pros where there's a lot more money to be thrown around. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the final part of your book is really a case study of the New England Patriots, who, of course, have had tremendous success over the last couple of decades, but have also been accused and in some cases caught of cheating on several occasions. Um, I Probably the most prominent one was Spygate. What exactly was Spygate? <clears throat> and I mean, how big of a, how elaborate of a, of a ruse was it? Because it, it was, they have, there were cover stories. There was a whole lot going on. Talk about Spygate a little bit. Yeah. So Spygate was, um, is a term that's used to refer to the Patriots collection activities where they were taping opponents, uh, defensive signals for the most part. Okay. And, um, and then matching up the signals to the play that was ran. Okay, so uh, it's pretty far-fetched to think that they were using that during a game, but what that allowed them to do is especially opponents that they were playing twice during the same season, such as AFC East opponents, um, to get to, to learn those signals and then to be able to, you know, as their opponent call them out, to know what the upcoming play was going to be, assuming that they didn't change them uh, before the next game. And... Um, so that went on all the way from the preseason of 2000 to uh, week one of the 2006 uh, season. And the, um, it was very effective. It was um, in- incredibly useful to the Patriots. Um, the NFL and teams eventually started catching on to it um, in the 2005 season. The NFL put out memos saying, hey, you know, don't do it. They didn't single out the Patriots. They said league wide, it's not permissible because up until that point, um, it was you could do that. Okay, there was no rule against it. There was nothing against it, um, and other teams had done it in the past. Um, Jimmy Johnson, you know, Cowboys former head coach, said oh, we did it as well. We just we we weren't we didn't find it useful, so we stopped doing it. For the Patriots, they found it very useful, and they and and that's why they carried it on for so long. Um, so, but eventually the NFL put out policy saying, Hey, don't do it. The Patriots continue to do it nonetheless. Now, um, at some point, whether it was at the beginning or whether this evolved over time, they started employing a bunch of security measures not to be caught. Okay. So, um, so what they did is they used an extra cameraman to be able to take these signals. So one, they had a ruse for, Hey, what's the reason we have an extra cameraman? When all the other teams are using two and we're using three, why? We need a story behind that. They did. Okay. Furthermore, we don't want to look like we're members of the Patriots staff because that just brings up questions. So let's put in and wear NFL stuff with just an NFL logo. Okay. Or if we're wearing Patriots paraphernalia, let's tape over the Patriots emblem or the Patriots name so that teams can't see that. 
Furthermore, when our cameras are recording, okay, there's a little red light that comes on. We're going to tape over that so that people can't see. They won't be able to see that we're actually recording. So it'll look like, oh, you know, I was just, I was just trying to zoom in. I was just, you know, I was getting the camera ready. We'll use it later. I wasn't recording nothing, you know, nothing to worry about here. Nothing to see. Move along. And um, they had all kinds of stories. They were, it, and they were trained on all this, okay? The head of the Patriots videography department trained all of the videographers on what do you do and what do you say in any given scenario? How do we cover all of this up? And so it was a very professional um, operation that they had up and going and running. And um, eventually they were caught by the Jets who, you know, um, who had a former, the Jets coach was a former member of the Patriots staff. And he actually called Bill Belichick before a game and said, hey, uh, I know what you do and don't do it when you come here to New York. And Bill Belichick and all his hubris said, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, and he did. And the Patriots and their security staff were ready for it. And they let the videographer film for long enough to provide damning evidence to the NFL. And then the NFL, then the Jets security members uh, confis- stopped, you know, um, they detained him and confiscated the tape and turned it over to NFL security and really forced the NFL's hand who had twice, had, you know, the, the Patriots had been reported on numerous times before. And had never been willing to do anything. And the Jets really forced the NFL's hand to do something. And um, I don't think they would have otherwise. Um, I don't think they wanted the scandal. I don't think they wanted the headaches. And uh, the Jets just said pretty much, yeah, we're not going to let that fly anymore. Um, and so uh, they forced the NFL to take action. And um, and they did. And they lost, um, they lost uh, uh, draft picks. They lost. They were fined. Um, their team and their coach was fine because of that. Um, but you know, um, the Patriots continue to do much the same stuff. Um, they've been caught since then taping other, uh, teams, uh, games, um, and have been punished for it again, um, which went relatively under the radar. Uh, the NFL doesn't, you know, necessarily like to advertise all of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, it, it's that. So that's that's Spygate in a nutshell. And you document other examples of the Patriots cheating or 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 being suspected of of cheating. Um, I think a lot of people heard about the Flate Gate. I don't know why everything has to end in a gate. Uh, it's, it's, like, it's like that's like the worst thing to come out of Watergate, right? Every scandal is a gate. Um, but uh, <clears throat> there was the Flate Gate. Talk a little bit about how there, were, there was, <clears throat> excuse me, speculation that they were interfering with uh, headsets, opposing teams' headsets. Um, do you get the sense that people around the league, are other teams, coaches, are truly offended and or outraged by the Patriots' quote unquote cheating, or do you think they're just pissed off because the Patriots have been so successful at it? Um, I think you're gonna have a bit of both. Um... So what I will say is, you know, when I, what I tried to do when it came to headset tampering, which is something, you know, the, the, the Patriots has been suspected about on for a while was, you know, I was like, well, let me gather all of the, you know, all of the accusations that we, I can find that are out there right, in, in open source media, kind of put it all together and, and see what I can find. What, I, what I did conclude after doing all of that was, wow, uh, there's a lot of evidence um, it's, it's hard to just turn your back on the, the toughest thing to say is how do they do it? Right. Because when you're talking about encryption, that's being used on these headsets nowadays, it's military level encryption, which means that you've got like less than a one in a million chance of, of, you know, just being able to stumble on and, and, and be able to, you know, figure out what's the right code to be able to use. It's just not going to happen. Um, so the question in everybody's mind that everybody's been trying to answer is, okay, yeah, there's all these anecdotes for that show, yeah, it's very probable and very possible that that teams' communications have been interrupted. But how would the Patriots do that? So, you know, one of the things that they are um, ha- that anonymous 
former Patriots coaches have admitted to um, journalists and said that, that that they used to do was they they said you know stealing signals from other teams, recording signals, all the Spygate stuff wasn't really the big thing that we did that was the most advantageous. It was breaking into opponents' locker rooms before the game and stealing the list, the play sheets with the uh, with the like first fifteen scripted plays, ten to fifteen scripted plays of a game. And when you know that, you basically know about a quarter's worth of calls that are coming up. And some coaches actually call those plays in order for the most part. So it's not just here are ten or fifteen possible plays. It is these are the plays I'm going to run in order, and I'll only break from this order if it's like you know a a, a third and short situation. And then I'll then I'll okay I'll plug in one of these plays, which is probably going to be listed, and they're probably going to run those plays in order too. And so you know they said that was the most helpful thing. But I got thinking, you know what? If you're stealing those from other teams' locker rooms, well, what else can you steal? These radio radio frequencies. Right, they're going to be changed every game. They're going to be handed out on paper. Hey, here's today's radio frequency. And I'm like, wait, that's that's how I would do it, man. All you got to do is find that out. You don't need some. You don't need to hire somebody and pay him. You know, the best, the best. You know, signals intelligence collector in the world, two million dollars to be able to do. Heck, all you got to do is get a bunch of numbers. And if you're already, you know, suspected of, you know, if you're going into other teams' locker rooms, you got to wonder, are they going into other teams' hotels? Where else are they going? What else are they doing? And to try to get all this information, right? So um, that's how I suspect if it was done that, that the Patriots were doing it. Um, it makes a lot of sense. It'd be very easy. And, and gosh, you got to wonder, you know, at that point, are you able to do more than just interfere? with their with their play calls are you actually able to listen in on what they're calling now of course they're send they're still sending in those plays via signals meaning they're not going to say hey we're going to do uh we're running the ball up the middle okay there's it's still going to be a play that's you know 42 x-ray on you know on hut whatever you know so they still have to learn all of that. What is that play call? What does that play call mean? But if you can put all of that information together, then heck, I mean, you've got it. You know exactly what they're running every single time, just like you used to know with Spygate, when you could decipher all those plays. So it, um, you know, that's that's the big fear and the big wonder. And especially you got all those years when the Patriots just were just rolling over everybody. Um, and obviously they've got one of the great coaches and quarterbacks of all time. Um, but there's a lot of stuff out there to wonder about. Yeah. As, as somebody who works in, in information, safeguarding information, gathering information, you spent years studying the subject in the NFL. Did you find any vulnerabilities that you think haven't been exploited yet? In, in the information gathering world, any, any ways, any new ways that teams could potentially gather information on opponents? Um, yeah. So what I will say is, um, so, you know, just like in the international world of espionage, how, how tactics are always changing, um, especially with the, uh, with the evolution of technology, same things going on in the NFL. So, you know, back in the in the old days, the threat used to be a lot of uh, using planes and helicopters overhead to spy on people. Well, the threat today is is drones, and and what you can do there um, with spying on practices, which is, you know, I think using planes and helicopters is pretty far fetched. Uh, using drones is very realistic. It can be done. It's very simple. They're very very hard to detect if used well. Um, you're not going to know they're there. They have very powerful cameras that you can get. Um, and, and frankly, you can plug and play with anybody who's got a little bit of knowledge on this. Um, you can take a regular over-the-market drone and, and create a very powerful super drone with just some pretty simple replacements, um, such as in camera technology and, and all of that stuff. So, um, so that's a very real threat. The other big threat is, like I mentioned before, playbacks you know, used to be all on paper and whatnot. Um, all of the team's information, now they're on computers. 
And so I was actually talking to a drone expert about this um, a while back. And here's what he told me. He said, Kevin, with that drone, not only could I watch another uh, another team's practice like that and never be caught, and I'm 100% positive I could do that, but if they're if they have their tablets on the field that they're using connected to Wi-Fi, I can suck up everything that's on that tablet using that drone. He's like, I can install some off-the-shelf um, software, and it will allow me to suck up everything. And he's like, all, all I got, and I said, well, what if it's you know that's going to be password protected and all that type of stuff? He's like, Kevin, I'll have that broken seconds, seconds. He's like, it's not even a, it's not even a problem. Um, so, and he said, I can suck up everything they have on there. So, you know, it's, that's obviously a big threat today is, is how are teams protecting their information that is kept on electronic devices? And, you know, teams will tell you like those tablets that they use. Yes, they can be, um, you know, they, a lot of them will, they require your fingerprint to access it. Um, or, um, they can be wiped remotely. Meaning if a player loses his playbook, a team can just go, you know, a security official can just go in and say, hey, Jimmy's playbook, it's wiped. Ching! And 30 seconds later, all the information on that thing is gone. But if, you know, if teams are linking that thing up to Wi-Fi, it's vulnerable. Just like, you know, with like we fear, you know, hackers in hotel rooms, right? Same type of stuff. Same thing there. And then furthermore... Um, computers, anything that's connected to the internet is potentially, is, is potentially a threat. So, you know, my question becomes, are teams using standalone computers for their most sensitive information? Meaning computers that are never connected to the internet, because once you connect to the internet, there's a threat. Somebody out there can potentially hack in and take your information. It's just, it, it's just a matter of how much time, effort, and money they're willing to throw at the problem. Because if they're willing to, they can get there. And that's the bottom line. So um, so those are the big threats going forward. I would also say as the NFL becomes you know, bigger and more powerful and is worth more and more money, we've seen that you know, the NFL has become, and NFL security and team security has become more professionalized. Um, but what I would argue is that there's still a long way to go in professionalizing the collection and protection of information. Some teams have, are very good about it and hire, um, you know, people that, um, you know, former intelligence professionals to do this, to help them in these efforts. And some teams just rely on coaches or assistants who do this type of stuff as an additional duty. And I think a lot of the methods that teams use um, could be vastly improved upon if they're willing to pay a professional how to do it. And um, I'll, I'll give you one example. So uh, lots of teams collect information using open source uh, information, meaning what's out there that's on the TV or on radio um, that you know teams talk about, or maybe it's footage from a practice. Um, and so teams go through all that, and uh, typically what they do is they'll have an assistant say, hey, go through the, go, go do an internet search and see if you can find out anything, anything interesting. Maybe it's on a hurt player. Is he really hurt? How hurt is he? Whatever. Well, even if you do find something, okay, so let's say we found something that says uh, Patrick Mahomes, he's injured and he's not going to be playing in the next game, okay, according to something that a fellow player said. Okay, so if you're the opposing coach and you get this information that, that one of your um, staff members, you know, just found. Do you believe it? Well, heck, that's a tough question. Okay. So one, do we trust this reporter? Do we trust the player to have accurate information? Do we trust the coach not to be providing us intentionally false information? Okay. I, and so you don't know, the, the answer is you don't know whether you can trust the information on, or not. And a lot of coaches just go, you know what? That's great. You found it, but I don't know if we can trust it. So thanks for bringing it to me but we're never going to do anything with it anyway, right? What I would argue you should be doing is you should be vetting all of this information. You should be vetting the reporters it comes from. You should be vetting the coaches to see if they're running in intentional deception operations. So meaning you take the information before the game. Okay, great. We don't know where we can use it. And then you see what happens during the game. Oh, Patrick Mahomes played. Okay, guess what? We can't trust this. 
We can't trust the information from maybe it's this person, this reporter, or from this coach, or whatever it is. And then over time, you assess all this and you build a per, you build a database out and you make it professional and you say, okay, well, 80% of the time, information that comes from this reporter is trustworthy. He's obviously an inside source. We know he he's a someone the coach talks to one on one. Blah 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 blah. We can probably trust information coming from him. Whereas this guy over here, nope, no good. And anything that comes directly out of that coach's mouth, we know 50% of the time it's just lies. Or maybe better yet, 80% of the time it's lies. And so if it does come out of his mouth, we can go, eh, that's probably false. We can assume the exact opposite is true. So, you know, having those capabilities to be able to look at things um, in a very professional manner would be very helpful to teams, but most simply have not devoted the time or effort to go to those links. And, I, and that applies across all the various different collection capabilities that are out there. Got it. All right, Kevin, I'm going to get you out here with one last question that I'd like to ask all my guests. Um, but first, once again, the name of Kevin's book is Spies on the Sidelines, the High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. Um, it's, it's just fascinating stuff in there. And a lot of the, I mean, Kevin does a great job of kind of culling together all these different uh, examples of, uh, we talked a little bit about about it with skunking, um, but it, in, in all the different types of intelligence gathering, um, he provides excellent examples, which really brings it to life. Um, so Kevin, my final question for you is, what is your all-time favorite sports book? Wrong ears. All right. All right. So my favorite sports book, um, it's, it's called Badasses. It's about, it's about the Raiders. It's about John Madden's Raiders. So oh, okay. Yeah. If yeah. you have never read um, a book about the Raiders in the 70s and Al Davis and all that, man, go go pick up a copy. There's, there's a few. There's like four or five books um, that are done, um, by him and all of them are great. And I, I, man, I was just laughing so hard on some of these, just this, what characters those guys were. And, um, you know, John Madden, he, he had a bachelor's degree in psychology. And so he had a bunch of misfits and that's what these dudes were. I mean, they were like the bad news bears. Right. And he used his psych degree to figure out how do I, get a bunch of guys, dysfunctional guys that, you know, would probably look like they belong on, you know, a prison team. Right. And how do I get them to gel and actually be able to function as an NFL team? And, um, and so he does, and he walks this fine line between having them be professionals, but at the same time, letting them blow off steam and be the crazy, crazy dudes that they are. And, um, and, and, where does that clash in the middle? And it just leads to a bunch of just hilarious stories. And um, I think it's a, a really funny read. And if, uh, yeah, NFL fans out there, um, yeah, after you, after you grab my book, I would, I would highly recommend, you know, um, yeah, reading, reading up on that topic. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. I'll have to check that out. And, the, and there's lots of great uh, Al Davis stuff in your book. Um, I mean, a lot of, <clears throat> lots of anecdotes, uh, Lots of he was clearly ahead of his time in many ways, and uh, particularly with intelligence gathering. And I found the whole thing fascinating how he 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 called Bill Belichick in for a job interview, and basically he was basically just trying to get information from him. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think that was one of the interesting things that I saw in the book. You know, I mean, I started writing the book because of all things, you know, Belichick and all that, and you know, that's kind of where the idea all came from, obviously. But what I saw in that book was. You know, it goes all the way back to George Hallis, you know, who's yeah. considered by many the founder of the NFL, the first coach and um, owner of the Bears. And, you know, went right through with like Sid Gilman, Paul Brown of the Browns, um, Weeb Eubank with the Jets and the, uh, the Colts and, um, you know, Al Davis with the Raiders. And these guys have all been doing stuff along the same lines of Bill Belichick, you know, long before Belichick ever came around and actually – uh, Belichick idolized Al Davis. So, you know, that tells you where he got all his shenanigans from. And right. so, you know, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about the Patriots here today, but I think the one thing I tried to really impart in the book was that, man, this, this stuff has been around forever. It will always, it's always going to be around. And um, it is not just a, a Patriots thing by any means. 
Right. All right. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was really a pleasure to talk to you about spying in the NFL. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Appreciate you having me on.